Hello and welcome to ThinkPod, powered by the FII Institute. I'm your host, Mark Barton. For over two decades, I've been at the forefront of global conversations on the issues that matter the most. In this series, I'll be meeting those leaders who are rising to tackle the grand challenges that face humanity right now. We'll be together assessing those radical ideas and transformative solutions that will benefit both people and planet. In this episode, we're joined by David Palmer, blockchain lead for Vodafone Business. We discuss how Web3 will transform business and society and whether big tech will ruin the metaverse. David, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure to be here, Mark. Web3 comes with so much promise, so much potential, yet many just say it's the same old iteration repackaged. What's Web3 according to David Palmer? Web3 at its most basic is decentralization Mm -hmm. of technology and, and access to that technology. Um, So if you look, there's two basic generations of technology we've been through. One of them is Web 1, which is about internet and cloud. Uh, Web 2 is more about mobile. So it's bringing the accessibility of technology uh, to the handset, uh, into the hands of, um, I think, 6.1 billion people uh, as of uh, to to date. Uh, But Web 3 is about decentralization. So it's about allowing more people to be a part of of the technology. Uh, So people... Uh, running nodes on blockchains, people building applications on decentralized uh, platforms. Um, so so that, that is the core of it, decentralized technology. More democratic, trust, inclusive, transformative, uniting. Those are some of the buzzwords. But David, you know better than me, Web 2 came with the same buzzwords. Persuade me Web 3 is any different? Well, I think the jury's out. So, so, so I think um, yeah, I've thought about this a lot. And uh, Web2, so if you look at some of the big internet companies, I think the allegations uh, that mm. have been put at them is about data. And, and it's, uh, you know, uh, my data is being exploited. It's being turned into information which is being sold. But if you look at it the other way, we've also got some pretty good services, right? So Google's pretty good at finding things if you go into a search search engine, uh, you know, Uber, you know, pretty good at uh, providing uh, embedded finance, customer experience for transport. And Facebook and some of the other social media companies are are pretty good at putting us in touch with each other and Mm -hmm. allowing sort of dynamic communications. And the price we pay is our data. Um, And and, and, Does Web3 remove that fear then? Possibly uh, if one key component is implemented, and that's uh, self-sovereign digital identity. Which we'll, which we'll come to, and that's yeah. a, you know, a fascinating conversation. Go back a couple of steps, because blockchain, Internet of Things is your thing. Just remind us what Internet of Things is. Internet of Things is about um, connecting devices. As we know, I think at the moment... Uh, you know, there's billions of devices, mm-hmm. over 20 billion uh, devices in the world. Uh, these devices range from connected cars, connected cabinets, uh, sensors, drones, all of them connected and providing data. 75% of that data isn't used, um, but, but, but it's about connecting devices, connecting people, connecting devices, connecting uh, the organizations that own those devices. Why is so much of that data not used, 75%? Uh, well, this gets on to the, the next part. So, so the Internet of Things is evolving into something called the economy, the economy of, of things. things. Yeah. So the problem was twofold for Internet of Things. Number one is that uh, the devices are siloed. So you have devices... Uh, that are owned by an organization, and essentially they will collect data and send the data back to that organization who will use it in their business model or or processes. So that that is the first problem. The second problem is that a lot of the data, the value is near real time. Mm -hmm. So if 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 you're a fleet truck who has some spare capacity, the information that you have that spare capacity is only valuable if it can be relayed to someone who wants to purchase that spare capacity because they have a demand for for that capacity at that point in time going in that direction. Mm. Two things. Number one is yeah, siloed uh, organization, siloed data. The other one is near real time not being possible with technology in the past. And that's led to a lot of the data actually being a liability, mm. um, you know, in terms of having to store it and comply with privacy and other things. Now, the economy of things does two things. Number one, 
uh, it, it it connects devices or it, it provides interoperability of, for devices. So this means that devices across organizations can start to uh, communicate with each other in a secure way. I'll explain why in, in a minute. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is they can transact with each other. One of the biggest things I expect to be transacted in the economy of things is data. It will feed into new dynamic business models. Yes. So whereas before um, you had a you, you had data lakes and data models and data marketplaces that basically put algorithms on on, on data to find out okay you know given the past six months uh, where should I drive my car or or what's the optimum time to plant my vegetables etc. Mm -hmm. But but when you get into real time data as I was saying it's you know can I sell. Uh, this video on my dash cam now, can I sell this spare capacity yeah. in my fleet? Can I sell this sensor data right now because it's needed at this minute? And, and I think that starts to make the data more valuable to more people, um, but it also starts to uh, incentivize people to come in and build marketplaces so you can have uh, more buyers and sellers linked. The marketplaces don't exist at the moment in any big way. For and how does blockchain, David, fit into all this? How does it add value to the Internet of Things ecosystem? So, so we come back to the point I raised, which, yes. which was about uh, the silos. That's right. So if you think about the world um, and, and the processes we have, a lot of these processes are based on trustless yeah. transactions, trustless processes, trustless business models. And that means there's a lot of checking, right? So for example, if uh, you know, if a fleet company wants to sell um, something dynamically to a logistics company looking to deliver something, generally you go through checks, uh, you go through contracts, and there'll be a process of legal signing that's there. What the blockchain provides at its most basic is trust. And that trust, uh, provides the basis for dynamic transactions. Mm. So it addresses the problem of trust. It, it's the be-all and end-all, the answer. It, exactly, when yeah. you link it to an identity. So I'll go into our solution, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but it's, it, it's where you have um, identity which is anchored in a trusted blockchain, yeah. you know, which is immutable, which is a record of, uh, of transactions, a record of events, um, that you have the ability for a fleet company and a, a, a company who's looking to distribute their goods able to have a dynamic real-time transaction. Go, go into your solution then at, at Vodafone because I know that you're leveraging blockchain to create digital identities. It's going to be applied both in the metaverse, which we're going to come to, and in real life. So what's your solution here? Uh, the platform uh, that was launched by uh, the CEO of Vodafone, Nick Reed, in on the 28th of, of February at Mobile World Congress mm. uh, is called the Digital Asset Broker. Yeah. Uh, the Digital Asset Broker platform does just that. So it brokers transactions for uh, IoT devices. So there's three main components to it. One of them is interoperable identity passport. Yeah. So this is where devices can basically speak to devices owned by other owners. So it can go cross ecosystem, yeah. providing that sort of interoperable passport for identities anchored in the blockchain. The other side is authentication and security. This is where I think telcos are very strong. Uh, so we have two types of cryptography that we provide uh, on the SIM card. One of them is asymmetric uh, cryptography. So that's largely used in the digital blockchain world called PKI, private public key encryption. That is available on the SIM card uh, as well as symmetric uh, cryptography. What that basically means in plain terms is that you have the ability to put a SIM in a device. That SIM will give the device an identity which allows that device to speak to all the other devices on the platform the device can use the cryptographic keys to secure data and sign transactions. Uh, and then the third component we've built on that is a wallet, uh, which allows the device to essentially uh, link with other wallets uh, by banks or other organizations and transact. Why are digital identities so important? They're able to bring back a lot of information that otherwise would have to be proved in a, in a timely frictionless manner. So if you think about it, if you, if you just look at some stats, right? So, so at the moment, I think the population of the world is over 7 billion, right? Um, and the population of connected devices is over 20 billion. <laughs> so, so how many people are there to check every device, every certificate in every transaction? If, you, if we're moving to a world of autonomous transactions, autonomous devices, um, you know, automatic, autonomous commerce and business between devices, then you've got to have a way of um, number one, automating identity checking. 
uh, and automating uh, the payments that, that that are associated with that. And digital identity is a way of doing that. It's a way of having a digital record of the device, its owner, key attributes of the device, which then, uh, when linked with a blockchain, provides trust so others can trust it and, and access it uh, with permission of, of the device owner. Uh, and, and that is then a basis uh, when you link it to something called a smart contract for automatic transactions. Let's talk about smart contracts. We're going to break some of these this terminology down, David, because sure. not everyone knows what a DAO is, a smart contract. Let's go back a few steps. What is a smart contract and why does it matter so much? Smart contract is basically uh, you know, business logic in code, um, which is uh, executed on a blockchain to fulfill the intention of that contract or the objective of it. So there are smart contracts. Uh, the leading platform for this is Ethereum. And indeed, what has happened is a lot of the other platforms have what's called an Ethereum virtual machine, uh, which allows an Ethereum smart contract to run on them. Even platforms being used by governments like Hyperledger Besu, which has an Ethereum virtual machine, so you can run an Ethereum smart contract on that platform uh, as well. So, so how are smart contracts going to change the way we do business then? I think at the moment, um, the, the, there's something called decentralized finance, which was DeFi, DeFi, uh, which was built largely on Ethereum in the crypto winter. So there's a lot of developers with nothing to do uh, in, in COVID. And, and uh, you know, at the end of it, I think everybody was surprised um, with, the, with, with decentralized banking. And, and when what DeFi does, it democratizes banking. So essentially, you've got a smart contract, which is run. Um, you know, which has something called liquidity pools. So, so it, it allows you know, individuals or companies to contribute to provide a liquidity pool for borrowing. And then you have yield farms, which are the returns, right? So it's democratizing the banking Which function. many can't get their head around that you can earn yields of double digit figures. How does it work? That's it. So, you, so, so, you, so a lot of the, the, the uh, DeFi uh, lending is over leveraged, uh, so it's people are borrowing are, are having to put a lot of collateral up. But but it's just the cutting out the middleman, which is what blockchain is meant to do. So so rather than having an intermediary, uh, which is doing that function, you're having a peer to peer essentially where where a group of people are coming together, putting their money together to form a liquidity pool, and they're getting the yields when people borrow it. Tell us what a DAO is, because let's not just drop it in yeah. decentralized yeah. autonomous organizations. Yeah, it's, it's, and why it's so important for business. Yeah, so, so it's an organization that is essentially um, governed, so it has a governance model, which is executed via a smart contract. And generally it allows decisions uh, to be made automatically uh, because they're executed via a smart contract. But it also allows um, you know, people, a, a wide range of people to participate and vote mm -hmm. on key things for the organization. And, and that's another sort of smart contract innovation that's, that, that's come about in the, in the last sort of two, three years, which is getting a lot of attention. Now, will it replace the status quo? I don't think so. I think when you actually look at the... Will the status quo allow it to replace it? I, I think there'll be a hybrid, but I, but I think what it's shown is that you can bring more efficiency to the market. And um, I, I think also if you look at what the existing financial institutions are doing, yeah, it's very sophisticated, you know, credit default swaps, derivatives, mm. you know, the sheer volumes that are going through banks that don't, where, where the computers don't break down, right? They're, 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 everything works and it's a uh, split second. So I think the two things will converge. And I, I think something like DeFi will be another product that the financial institutions offer. But, you know, it, it, you know the, in, the innovation of smart contracts, uh, DAOs, um, you know, DeFi are showing what, what is possible and uh, forcing the incumbent financial institutions to innovate. Yeah, let's talk about the metaverse. Another sort of buzzword, Web3, metaverse. I think for many of our viewers and listeners, David, the metaverse conjures up a, a 3D game world. <laughs> <laughs> is there an element of truth in that? So I think the first question is, does the metaverse exist? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that is the fact. I think the metaverse is something we're aiming towards, but it's not something that exists in its final form uh, in any way yet. I mean, we don't have the technology to have... Do we even know what it is? I, I think at a very high level, it's a sort of immersive um, you know, digital experience uh, where people are allowed to interact and cross uh, different ecosystems and journeys. 
you could argue that uh, that the internet, uh, you know, provides that to an extent. But the metaverse is really, in my view, a framework, which, you know, for Web3 uh, gives it a role to provide trust. Because just as I, I was explaining mm. uh, with the internet of things and, and the blockchain providing interoperable identity for uh, the movement to the economy of things, to have that sort of trusted transactions. In the same way, the metaverse um, needs trust. Essentially, there's going to be many worlds, in my view, in the metaverse. What's the Vodafone metaverse world? Uh, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. <laughs> there's, going to be, there's going to be many worlds in the, in the, in the metaverse. Yeah. And, and what will be key is how you can interoperate between them, how you can transition between them uh, with an identity which, which is, is where you come in. And yeah. I'll also hold value right, right. Uh, across them because you'll be able to pay to earn in one game and go and spend that uh, in, in another metaverse. And, and, and so there's a whole economy that underpins it. So are you providing the bridge? Again, it's something that is an aspiration, mm. um, which is to say, okay, the cellular phone number, the cellular cryptography is very powerful. It's, been, it's something that we're leveraging for uh, the economy of things. And I personally believe that the phone number um, you know, could be the identity that is able to link someone's online activity uh, be that purchases, uh, be that uh, you know, participation, collaboration in different areas with a, a real identity in the real world. So the phone number um, you know, would, would be a good candidate in a self-sovereign way. So not, not, not something where you know, one, any one telco owns it, but something where it's self-sovereign, but it could be a good identity point to tra always trace back to someone. Because if you think about the metaverse, there's a few problems that need to be discussed. Number one is which metaverse, right? Yeah. So, so the, the, in the metaverse, there is not there's the, the meta version, formerly known as Facebook. Yeah, and there's a truly decentralized version. Exactly, and, yeah. and, and they may both coexist. But the issue you have is, you know, the, uh, one of the key use cases is land. So, so mm -hmm. gaming absolutely is one play to earn gaming. Yeah. And moving across uh, different, land, different like Decentraland and the sandbox in, in land, Decentraland yeah. sandbox. Um, you know what they're doing is selling land for a lot of money. So, yeah. so in in sandbox, you'll see a lot of the big banks and big retail organisations have opened up stores so you can buy digital apparel and other things. But a lot of people are buying plots of land. So, so there's people buying sort of Miami or Park Lane land plots or in That's the right. United Arab Emirates. But land in the real world, the value is determined by scarcity. In the metaverse, you don't have the concept of scar scarcity mm. because I could buy uh, land in Park Lane or you know, in, in the UK or UAE or Saudi or, or anywhere, you're a prime plot. But then another platform could come up and offer the same land. Um, and, and that could go on and on to fulfill some sort of demand. So, so there isn't the issue of scarcity and, and that you know, to, to have that scarcity, you'll need policy um, and you'll need some sort of macroeconomic planning. Who's doing policy well? Who are you working with, Vodafone, where policy is embracing all this? Yeah, so, so I think policy on the metaverse, the jury's out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say governments are watching where it goes. And I think the policy will need to come because when it becomes something that uh, it, you know, needs universal access, you need to have policies that promote universal access. And you may need policies that uh, have subsidies, uh, redistribution of income. You know, if the metaverse, uh, there were some uh, forecasts that the metaverse could be worth 20 to 30 billion in the next 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, then you've also got the issue of metaverse being significant part of the economy. Yeah. And macroeconomic policy like money supply, inflation, all of these things will need to encompass uh, the metaverse. Let's put this politely first. How do we ensure that the metaverse is democratized and inclusive? Or a bit nastier, how do we ensure that big tech doesn't screw it up? Um, so so I, I, I think that's a really good question. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the answer. I could give you my views on it. So, so this is where I think Web3 has a role. Yeah. So, so I think having a decentralized core to the metaverse based on self-sovereign principles um, you know, gives the basis where, where you can have universal access, you know, and sharing of data and control of, of, of the data and the joint share in the reward that comes from it. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you have one platform 
or, or a series of platforms that owns all the data and there's going to be so much more generated, then that just simply will not work. Um, so I think that's important. But but then I think the other side is just looking at the policy. I don't think anybody thought, thought it through. I think you know, everybody's jumping on it saying, yeah, immersive experience, let's buy some land, let's do play to earn gaming. But nobody's really um, you know, taken a step back and said, right, a lot of business will actually be done here. You know, how are we going to integrate this into our current mm. economic and business thinking and our current business models? And that requires you know, some policy oversight, in my view. David, we covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> well done. We covered blockchain, Internet of Things, Economy of Things, DAO, smart contracts, Web3, Metaverse. Boom, 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 boom. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. In these turbulent times, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to ThinkPod for more insight and analysis.